Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm your host today, Rath Wang. We'll look at the latest developments between China and the Philippines as Taiwan's southerly neighbor pivots closer to the U.S. We'll also take a look at what Taiwan's indigenous Yusan-class landing platform dock means for the nation's defense. Joining us are Leonard Chow, former Taiwan ambassador to the Kingdom of Eswatini and Mainland China Affairs Committee Chair at Taiwan People's Party, Stephen Tan, Managing Director of the International Policy Advisory Group, and Jason Su, Senior Research Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation, and former KMT legislator. A warm welcome to all on the show today. U.S.-Philippines defense ties have been its best in decades since President Marcos Jr. took office. We've seen the largest joint drills with Balikatan and the resumption of Cope Thunder after 30 years. China has also sent its top envoy, Qinggang, to visit Manila, followed by a goodwill Navy training ship and now a donation of 20,000 tons of fertilizer. Ambassador, what does all of this mean? Is this an attempt for China to win back the Philippines? Oh, well, uh, it's a resounding yes to this question. Because that the, uh, at the, um, when Marcos Jr. Uh, first assumed the office, uh, what happened was not the, uh, this time around that you, uh, the, the Philippines, but the China tried to win the Philippines back. What happened last year was uh, the U.S. wanted to, uh, to get the Philippines back. Because as we all know- And they succeeded. That's right. Because uh, Duterte, at the, you know, during his later days, you know, his country adopted uh, okay, a closer Okay, the Philippines and, and China relations kind of keep it distancing from the United States alliance. So the kind of the U.S.-Philippine alliance was under, you know, restraint. It's a kind of restrained relations because under the pressure of the Turkey. So when the Marcos Jr. first took office, so it was widely, uh, you know, uh, expected or anticipated that, you know, Ju Marcos Jr. would try to uh, uh, con continue the close to China policy following to Turkey. Well, despite the fact that, despite that, also in the personal uh, background for Marcos Jr., when he was a child or, you know, a, a young man, he would follow his uh, late father, Marcos, you know, Fernando Marcos, the late president of the Philippines, visiting China frequently. So uh, the, uh, the, the relationship, okay, during his childhood memory that uh, Marcos Jr. had a fond memory of China. So it was then the, uh, widely anticipated that he would adopt the Okay, a China, you know, a pro-China policy. So he deliberately, he deliberately adopted a, a so-called kind of, a, you know, a distancing the relations with China between the Philippines and China. So, as you know, that the uh, that caused the, uh, the the U.S. caused the U.S. you know a, a petition that we can win the Philippines back under a new president's leadership. So, uh, so that's what happened. You know, the U.S. You know, and the Philippines, the, the military drill, okay, the uh, you know, is larger scale in the last year. So this time, and uh, so China has witnessed that. So it definitely caused the China's uh, Beijing's uh, a great concern. Okay, so it's wrecking some nerves. In that's Beijing. right. So it, it, it got the, they got some. They have a good reason to be uh, to be concerned, if not worry about this a new scenario uh, between the the Philippines and China. So I think that's why you know the uh, the Qinggang, I say it's very common. It, 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 it's no surprise for for Chinese, uh, you know, you know, Fisher to have, uh, you know, try to uh, try to gain gain the you know the support back from the from Manila. So that's what happened this time. But still, I think uh, back to the question that you know uh, the uh, under the leadership of the current, okay, uh, the president of the Philippines, they tried to uh, keep uh, not only the distancing. Okay, the relations from with China, but also a, you know a security balancing policy between the U.S. and China. So I think the the Philippines is very uh, very smart. Try to adopt the uh, a new policy. Hopefully, they can uh, benefit from both sides. Both of them. keep up. You know, very uh, it's very that delicate balancing policy. Balancing so that's what indeed. happened right now. Um, Stephen, we've also seen um, Marcos Jr. go to the U.S. with a state visit and becoming more assertive in terms of Chinese claims. And we've seen the buoy set up by the Philippines in the West Philippine Sea. But also, as um, Ambassador mentioned, um, Marcos Jr. has had good words for China, saying that he wants to strengthen the relationship and also work in areas that they can both cooperate and benefit from. 
What can we read from these words? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we have to understand that uh, in the space of international relations uh, or diplomacy, it's not linear. It's, it's multifaceted, it's a multidimensional. So it is not a surprise that each and every country will fight for its own national interest. In, in that specific scenario for the Philippines, it's, it, it goes way beyond striking the balance between the U.S. and China or sort of, uh, you know, you know, double hatching uh, against uh, the, uh, uh, you know, ag against anything that, uh, that, that is not consistent with the national interests of its own country. But, but, it, but it's also um, sort of, you know, playing the, uh, playing double cards, you know, and you, you, you can see that the Philippines has well developed under the President Marcos Jr.'s uh, presidency, clear uh, strategy and direction, working in Indo-Pacific with the United States, having the trilateral U.S., Philippines, Japan uh, dialogues on, 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 on strategy, on defense, and on the, all the drills and exercises for the past few months, as you can see, whereas trying to send the signals to China telling China that there are lots of areas where the two countries can cooperate with each other, sending the signals by appointing the relatively China-friendly uh, uh, Minister of Defense, well receiving the donations and all that, and, and, I, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's still well received uh, by China. I think Beijing has an apparent, apparent need to continue to engage with the Philippines, setting aside the dispute um, in the South China Sea and many other uh, territorial, sovereign, you know, or even economic issues, whereas Beijing clearly understand that Philippines now and going forward, not just on the strategic, but also on, in defense and all other uh, areas uh, geopolitically are really at this, at, at this point in time and going forward on the size of the United States um, and, and, and Japan in formulating and aligning the relationship uh, facing the threat of China. No so doubt the first that. time in China. I, I, yeah, I think, I think it's very clear and I think Beijing knows that very well. Speaking of defense, um, Jason, do you feel China could successfully bring Philippines back to where it was in terms of the ambassador mentioned with um, President Duterte, where you saw kind of a bit of um, this exploring this security relationship that could foster. I, th I think it's going to be very hard to judge at this moment. I think uh, what uh, the uh, Marcos Jr. is trying to do is try to uh, figure out hi where his footing stands, especially testing water with the U.S. and also sending um, signals to China, they are also open for, for cooperation and open for s any type of uh, uh, economic uh, collaboration. But does that include defense, include security as well? So in, in a security uh, commitment, I think uh, the Philippines is still very clear that they need to stand with the U.S. and at least uh, they need the U.S.'s commitment to the Philippines as well. So what we are seeing is probably the small, small states in the ASEAN countries trying to double hedging. And this would be a uh, quite uh, prevalent strategies among the uh, small states uh, countries in that region that will <coughs> continuously uh, engage in China economically, but uh, in in terms of security and as well as the, the uh, defense wise, uh, they are pretty clear uh, they will be uh, standing uh, with with the United States. Uh, and wh where does that mean for for Taiwan? Uh, obviously, we need we need to be careful in uh, countries that we are already working and that are still uh, uh, re-establishing re relationship with uh, mainland China. And we need to make sure that our businesses, especially our civilians in those countries, their operations are not compromised by any some sort of uh, uh, gray zone operations there. Uh, but at least I think uh, at the moment, um, uh, what we see is at least from the uh, first island chain, uh, Indo-Pacific security, uh, commitment. Uh, Philippines uh, plays a very strong um, entry point uh, coming from the uh, uh, South China Sea uh, perspective. So Taiwan must be uh, vigilant in watching how the situations uh, unfold, especially uh, whether uh, the, uh, um, the infrastructure um, 
uh, robust robustness in that region uh, can be established and what role uh, Taiwan's technology sector can play a role in helping uh, boosting the uh, critical infrastructure in Subic Bay uh, concerning the uh, uh, internet cable and uh, uh, submarine cable. Stephen, in the context of the Philippines, as Jason mentioned, um, um, it's an important um, partner or key country to look at. How important is the Philippines to Taiwan's defense? Well, I think the Philippines is a critically important ally of the United States. When it comes to the, um, uh, you know, any changing dynamics of the peace and stability of the Taiwan Strait, uh, I think um, the United States will have a uh, compelling interest to look into that very closely. Uh, of course, one of the key partners in this region is Japan. Another one is South Korea. But knowing that there are things that's happening uh, in the East China Sea and also uh, the North Korea, in North Korea, I think the United States has been developing the relationship and solidified the relationship uh, with the Philippines, um, in, and not just in this, on the issues of the South China Sea, but also in its north, which is Taiwan or Taiwan Strait. Now, uh, I think um, for the past few months, you see that um, the United States has doubled the size of the military base in the Philippines, and that is in the written um, agreement or treaty uh, with, the, with the two governments or with the two administrations. And it's in this phase of implementing as we speak. And, and that, is, that goes way beyond symbolic gestures. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's put into an implementation plan and it's increasing um, the military forces in that space and also the, 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 the joint drills and all that. So I think strategically, geopolitically, and even in terms of the defense and the strengthening the military base and the military force in this region, Philippines continue to play a critically important role, not just in this region you know, uh, on the neutral basis, but also aligning with the United States. But you believe it's also a reliable partner for the U.S.? Well, I think so. So, f so far under They're the, not going to flip-flop. Uh, well, you know, under the uh, Marcus Jr.'s um, uh, administration, it seems to be that it is, um, it has developed a, a, a pretty reliable um, a relationship between those two countries. And from Taiwan's perspective, I mean, watching what's happening in that space is also important for us because we need, we need friends. Uh, we need friends other than the United States. Uh, we're not directly engaging with the Philippines in terms of the defense, but through the United States uh, in the south, in the south of Taiwan, basically. And I think it will, it has become, and it is becoming a more important uh, force. Ambassador, what do you say to that, especially in terms of um, President Marcos saying that the bases are for defensive pers purposes? Well, I think, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, speaking of the geopolitical, you know, uh, consideration that Taiwan is bound to be intertwined with the Philippines in many respects. You know, geographically. It, geographically, you know, national, not only the national security, uh, now also economic, you know, economic you know, reality, but also I'd like to point out the, uh, the increasing importance of the, uh, the South China Sea. You know, in the, at, at the present time, the worst one third of the worst shipping goes through the South China Sea. So that make it, this, this region, also the Philippines, of course, you know, uh, Taiwan is, is a part of it. That this is one of the most important uh, maritime waterways, okay? And, uh, you know, trade routes of all the shipping in the world. So uh, uh, that's, a, that's a, I think, in this, in this context, the United States and, uh, and, and, and Philippines and the China is kind of a triangle. The U.S. and, and China definitely are going to se severely competing to, uh, to, uh, to gain the support of, of the, the Philippines. Philippines. Yeah, I think the Philippines wouldn't mind, you know, uh, you know in, the, in this context, trying to gain, you know, uh, something from both of the countries. So in this regard, I think Taiwan has to be uh, uh, watching that very closely. And also, I'd like to point out the, uh, some of the, in addition to the national security, okay, but also the economic, you know, uh, reality, the territorial, okay, territorial integrity of the Philippines. I think we all remember that one of the most controversial you know, uh, issues between uh, China and the Philippines, in particularly in the last, uh, you know, the administration and the latter days of the Duterte that, okay, China, you know, Duterte obviously kind of downplay the importance of the very famous, you know, the year 2014, the ar arbitration ruling 
Mm. Okay, and uh, that was, uh, that's rejecting the Chinese. Uh, it's still ongoing. You see the second that, Thomas Shoal. That's right. The China say, you know, China expensive claim in the in the in the South China Sea. So I think now this time, you know, Marcos, uh, uh, upon uh, assuming the, the presidency, he said he he said that I will not going to surrender our territorial integrity to uh, to any foreign power. So I deliberately he want to beef up in a position that okay, that caused the concern of China. So they're trying to try, try to negotiate. Trying to you know uh, uh, reach uh, uh, you know a rapprochement with uh, with Manila in this regard. So I think uh, that the issue is ongoing one. So I think it never meant to be seen between the U.S. and China and the Philippines. Indeed. Speaking of defense, let's now turn to Taiwan's own indigenous capabilities. Our reporter Jamie Ocon has more on the launch of the Yisan class landing platform dock. This is Taiwan's first domestically made landing platform dock, the Yusan. It's a type of warship used to transport amphibious vehicles and heavy equipment around Taiwan and its outlying islands. It also has a full range of medical facilities that can be used for disaster relief and international humanitarian missions. The Yusan is the first of four ships in its class to be built by Taiwan and is named after the country's highest mountain. It's part of Taiwan's push to boost its domestic shipmaking capabilities and become less reliant on other countries for its defense. The ship was delivered to the Navy last year and underwent over a year of testing before entering service. The 153-meter-long Yusan is currently docked in the southern port city of Kaohsiung. The military says it's now getting ready to deploy the ship on its first mission. Howard Zhang and Hamio Khan for Taiwan Plus. Given that the Yusan class landing platform dock was built in Taiwan, Stephen, what is the significance of this? Well, obviously it's the first landing platform dock that Taiwan has built indigenously and I think that is a showcase of the strength of our indigenous defense. That's the first thing. The second thing is that this is in line with the uh, defense strategy that has been developed uh, since the beginning of the Thai administration in 2016 and seven, seven and a half years later and then we see uh, Yushan class uh, the first landing platform dock that is being uh, that's you know in the process of being uh, uh, in the water and I think uh, this this not only strengthen our defense but also a demonstration of what we can do on our own you know by our own technology and it's uh, our our shipping capabilities and all that um, there, there are some critics, particularly on the issue of symmetry versus asymmetry. Is this uh, asymmetric, as we, you know, from time to time talked about, in terms of building up our asymmetrical defense? Maybe not. Are we going to build up another Yushan uh, class, um, you know, sh boat like this? Maybe not. But it's good to have, after seven, seven and a half, seven and a half years, to have a Yushan uh, class landing, uh, uh, landing platform dock as such. And then going forward, I, I know the direction of the gears have been shifted a little bit, and it's leaning more towards the asymmetrical defense, which we're very closely looking at. And I understand that Taiwan mm -hmm and Taiwan's defense department and its counterparts in the, U the United States have been working hand in hand and working very hard in building up the asymmetrical defense. And I will see that it's under development and it's coming forward. So going back, I think uh, the Yushan class, this is critically important and I will see how it goes going forward. Right, so it's not um, entirely obsolete or out of line with asymmetric defense. Um, so. Jason, given that you've been in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. you've joined many of um, the war games where the U.S. and China would come into direct combat mm -hmm. in the case of a, an invasion of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, the Yisan can carry 32 missiles. It can carry more than 200 Marines. What does this mean in terms of sending a message to China? 
Yeah, obviously this type of uh, mid-sized ship program has been ongoing for, for years. And as Stephen mentioned, it's, it takes almost eight years to build one ship. And the speed with which that this type of ship is, is launching is just simply not quick enough to address the urgency that uh, Taiwan faces. So what we are looking at is how can we build on top of such a platform? And what type of uh, asymmetrical capabilities can this type of platform uh, be uh, working with or uh, developing, um, using it as, as a launch platform uh, to develop the uh, asymmetrical capabilities that we all need? Um, if you talk about a amphibious invasion, uh, this is probably not the type of the platform that, that we would need. Uh, obviously, I think the most important thing is that how do we deter the enemies by denial? And this type of uh, mid-sized um, ships obviously has some launching capabilities for the missiles that it carries, but at a time with which that the uh, large amount of the ships China are able to uh, corner Taiwan, uh, one Yusan ship is simply not enough to address the problem we face. So the, the question is, where do we go from here? So How, where do we go from here? So as I said that, we need to uh, build on top of this Yusan platform the type of asymmetrical capabilities that can used to be deployed for um, undersea surveillance, uh, for um, the uh, detections of uh, potential uh, gray zone um, attritions and that all type of stuff. And these are the critical things that we need to look at. So one platform uh, launch um, is something that China will look at, but it's not something that China would be scared. So so I think that's, that's the, the, the critical thing is, where do we go from here and what sort of capabilities can we build on top of that? There's also um, talk of how the Yisan can send supplies to Jingmen and Matsu, which are outlying islands right next to China. Do you feel this could add to that dynamic in any way? Yeah, I don't think we, we spent eight years building one a mid-sized missile-ready uh, uh, ships in order just to send supplies to Jinmen and Matsu. There are other uh, ready capabilities that or that. deployments that we're already doing. And, and I think th this will be uh, underused or underutilized if it's for sending the uh, uh, supplies. So I think it's a signal uh, to China. We have some capabilities for indigenous uh, shipbuilding. But the question is that, you know, how far can we go from here in terms of developing the type of capabilities that we truly need, uh, which is, you know, uh, developing deterrence strat uh, capabilities to deny our enemies. Uh, for Yusan, it's, it's a mid-sized ship and it will be pretty hard to move and to sail at a speed that I think would, uh, we need to deal with uh, the type of uh, contingency that we will face. So we need to be looking at other potential uh, uh, options as well. Speaking of signals, um, Ambassador, you spent many years representing Taiwan at Taiwan's representative office in the U.S. That's right. And um, do you feel this ship sends any signal to Washington given Taiwan's commitment that Washington has been saying for a long time that Taiwan needs to do more? Well, I, uh, allow me uh, to be uh, frank and straightforward. I think it's uh, hardly uh, any uh, you know, substantial you know, uh, mean, meaning to, uh, to those, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> are concerned. Because uh, for the, uh, I kind of, uh, you know, uh, agree with both what the two gentlemen just mentioned about that. Because this uh, is a single uh, ship's building that I was told by my uh, military attache, you know, a friend of mine who used to work with me in Washington. I checked with him this morning, as a matter of fact. He, sa he said to me that this, uh, you know, uh, the Yusan uh, class, you know, uh, ships, was initiated about 10 years ago, yeah. 10 years ago. And then the, because th that's a part of the, uh, the, the Ministry of Defense, MOD's uh, uh, regular 10 years military build up plan, 10 year military build up. They, they, they kind of do this every 10 years, okay, to, to, to foresee what's going to be needed down the way in 10 years from now. So that's a part of the, uh, the idea. So this idea was uh, devised, uh, was initiated Okay, about less than 10 years ago, and now s finally it get realized. It's a good news. I agree, it's a good news. Better than How nothing. Uh, mm. Better than nothing. 
However, we have to, uh, as, as both gentlemen mentioned earlier, that we have to put this kind of in the context, in the large context of a national security strategy. So in your view, what should Taiwan need in the next 10 years? Well, we have to, uh, you know, we have to take a lot of, a lot of things, you know, a, a big variety of things into consideration, such as the uh, sustainability, not only the national security, you know, sustainability, and also given the, uh, our military uh, budget constraint, we have to, uh, to be careful. We have to, uh, to be, uh, to be uh, you know, uh, very, very uh, uh, cautious in calculating uh, the priority for our military, you know, uh, defense, military needs. What can better address our, you know, uh, military need and security okay, needs? So that 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 is you know, that concerns the uh, that's related to some not only uh, the the budget, you know, consideration, but also affordable. Also, the kind of a we have to uh, come up with some trade-off concept. What trade-off? You know, trade-off tolerance cost. So to pick and choose. And that's right. You know, you ha you, ca you cannot take you cannot build everything. Drop off items. That's right. You have to. You feel uh, you know, yeah, that's right. You have to make a very uh, calcul make a very very careful, you know, calculation and and the priority priority, you know, what uh, you know, consideration. So that requires a very very uh, comprehensive and uh, you know uh, you know complex thought. But in this context, I'm rather uh, doubtful, if not disappointed. Doubtful, disappointed. And speaking oh. of trade offs, Stephen. <laughs> Um, the Taiwan government and also the Ministry of National Defense are focusing a large deal of effort on completing the build, building up of submarines. How do you feel this will fit into Taiwan's current situation? Well, I think uh, continuing to build up the, the submarines has been a pre-existing um, defense strategy uh, that is a part of the implementa implementation of the strategy. Uh, but then, of course, there are, there are some critics as to whether we should continue to do this uh, submarine or whether, um, you know, having the submarine itself um, is a reflection of the asymmetrical uh, warfare strategy that we're putting together. So I, I think it's uh, lots of um, not just closed door but open debate. And I, I would uh, advocate that it is helpful. Actually, it's, a, it's extremely helpful to have an open dialogue and debates on the directions and the implementations of the national strategy, defense strategy, and strategic planning. So I think it, in, the, in the past, you know, MODs, uh, the, the procurements, uh, defense of the strategy is out of the national security, which is secretive. But you know, as an open society, as a fully democracy, then I think we should openly talk about it and debate about it. So I think this is very helpful to build the, to the nation, to the state building uh, in any aspect, including the nat national defense. I'm glad that Rafi asked that question. Submarine is a classic example that we can explore whether we should continue to do that, whether that's consistent with the asymmetrical uh, warfare strategies and why or why not. And I think it's, it's a long haul, it's a long process that we can continue to talk about. Jason, what do you say to that? Yeah, just to build on what both Ambassador and Steven said, I think the, the issue that we are facing is, is time to market or time to urgency. I think, I think the, the whole shipbuilding takes eight to 10 years. When I was in LY, we already, you know, urging that is to be launched as soon as possible, but it obviously got delayed and further delayed. I think what we need to address is the issues of integration. I think what we are lacking is so-called uh, COP, Common Operation Picture, among our allied uh, partners, such as Japan and even uh, a U.S. force. Uh, we haven't done any um, joint operation or joint exercises with them or integrating the uh, operations with them uh, for, for a long time. So we probably need to focus more on the software um, applications rather, and rather than uh, building hardware. Um, so whether it is the, sh the ship uh, platforms or the submarines, but I think more important is how do we integrate the, the type of capabilities we already have? And how do we make sure that our weaknesses is addressed uh, rather than building new things and learning to use it? And by the time we learn, learn the rope and then it's the, the, the next thing and it's we're not gonna to be able to address it. Yeah. But how are you using them indeed? Yeah.
Let's now hear from Rick Fisher, Senior Fellow at the International Assessment and Strategy Center based in Washington, D.C. Rick is also a longtime PLA military expert. Rick, the indigenous made Yisun class landing platform dock that Taiwan is launching full scale could increase its capabilities in transporting weapons and other necessary items to outlying islands. What does this mean in terms of Taiwan's deterrence of a potential Chinese invasion? Landing platform dock is a very important ship for the Taiwan Navy and for the Taiwan Marine Force. Immediately, it gives Taiwan the ability to outflank potential Chinese invasion vectors. Uh, that will probably be its most important utility for the defense of Taiwan. Uh, the ability to conduct uh, an, a landing close to the PLA landing, to contest that landing, to contain it, uh, will be invaluable to the defense of Taiwan and thus the deterrence of a Chinese attack. The, the landing platform dock is also a symbol of power projection. Yes, today there is a great noise about the need for Taiwan to have an asymmetric strategy with asymmetric capabilities. But Taiwan also requires the ability to project power in the form of submarines, in the form of large amphibious assault ships, because Taiwan does have uh, outposts that it also needs to defend uh, in the South China Sea and in the offshore islands. Uh, Taiwan sustaining a power projection capability is evidence as well to the people of Taiwan that their government is committed to the defense of all of Taiwan. And that is a very good thing. Taiwan's government is currently working on completing indigenous-made submarines. Will this add to the equation in making Xi Jinping think twice? Absolutely. Taiwan's indigenous submarine fleet will be one of the most important cores of Taiwan's future deterrent capability. Uh, if Taiwan does manage to build up to eight submarines, uh, this could allow Taiwan to surge a deployment of at least four to five submarines at any given time. Uh, each submarine will probably carry uh, 12 to 15 weapons, either cruise missiles or heavy torpedoes. And uh, this is a tremendous threat to any Chinese invasion fleet. Uh, if the submarines can dent the initial uh, large ships that will be employed by the PLA, both large amphibious assault ships in the Navy and mobilized very large civilian roll-on, roll-off ferries, that will buy time for Taiwan. That will tell Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party leadership that their invasion could fail. And as long as Taiwan is able to generate doubt in the mind of Xi Jinping that his invasion will fail, he will be deterred. Rick, Taiwan's top military research institute, the Zhongshan National Institute, just announced recently that is, it is upgrading its anti-cruise missiles. How effective will this be? Taiwan's production of offensive and defensive missiles is extremely important. Uh, I, I know that the, the, the Zhongshan Institute has devoted enormous resources to the research and development of a range of anti-ship missiles, land attack missiles, and uh, defensive surface-to-air missiles over the last 50 years. Uh, there are reports that Taiwan may produce up to a thousand missiles this year. This is very good news uh, and will add tremendously to Taiwan's own ability to deter 
Xi Jinping from thinking that his invasion could succeed. It is indeed critical that Taiwan continue to develop new missiles and produce thousands of them. It's also critical that the United States get in the act here and start shipping to Taiwan thousands more missiles, uh, anti-tank missiles, uh, shoulder-fired uh, infantry missiles, surface-to-air missiles, and yes, long-range land attack missiles as well. Apart from support from the United States, do you feel what Taiwan's doing within Taiwan with a combination of missiles, submarines, and warships is enough? Do you feel Taiwan needs to do more? Taiwan needs to do more. China still thinks that it can get away with an invasion. So yes, uh, uh, the government of Taiwan, the people of Taiwan, have to achieve a higher level of mobilization. In the years before Russia invaded Ukraine, the government of Ukraine, in cooperation with the United States and NATO allies, quietly mobilized the population of Ukraine. Most of the fighters that fought Russia to a standstill were civilians. They received a minimum of training. War provided, sadly, far more effective training. But Ukraine was able to stop the third most powerful army in the world. This should be inspiration for the government of Taiwan and the people of Taiwan. If the government of Taiwan were to decide to create a militia force of 2 million civilians, this would probably be more effective than atomic weapons in deterring Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping probably calculates that he will have to send three to four million soldiers and occupation forces to Taiwan. But if Taiwan will greet the first million with two million mobilized militia, armed militia, they will be defeated. Xi Jinping will understand this and he will not try to invade Taiwan. Speaking of Ukraine, the Kremlin has seen a 24-hour uprising within domestic forces in Russia. What do you think Taiwan can read from this? Taiwan would be well within its rights to be talking about all of the regime weaknesses of the People's Republic of China. The Russian regime experienced a near coup d'etat because it is weak internally, because it lacks support from the people and even its soldiers. It has committed a great nation to a useless and dangerous and losing war. It is fully appropriate for the government of Taiwan to explain to the world that a Chinese Communist Party decision to pursue a war against Taiwan will be an act of great weakness. It will be done in the context of Xi Jinping trying to preserve an illegitimate dictatorship over the 1.3 billion people of the People's Republic of China. A decision by Xi Jinping to start a war against Taiwan will quickly plunge the people of China into the same kind of deadly suicidal chaos that Russia is about to experience. Apart from large indigenous projects such as the Yusan and submarines, we've also heard from Rick Fishers on other items. Ambassador, do you feel Taiwan is doing enough in terms of indigenous weapons production? Well, uh, I would like to say that yes. 
Okay, uh, because uh, back to when I was working in Washington, you know, many years ago, I've heard from my uh, colleagues that the, uh, the our defense ministry and our uh, defense, uh, you know, community people, they're trying very hard to, uh, to, uh, to reach the dream, to reach the goal of our uh, indigenous military industry. However, you know, uh, the idea is one thing, reality is the other. Uh, given, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the uh, unexpected, you know, uh, you know, changes in the international situation and also our economic, you know, downturn for the last uh, couple of years, particularly after during the, the COVID-19, so, you know, the, uh, the, the impact that we have somehow limited the, uh, the development, okay, and uh, the pace of our indigenous, okay, uh, military uh, uh, build up capability. Uh, well, I shouldn't claim that I, I'm, I'm an expert in this question, but from what I heard that the, uh, this question, this, this issue has become a you know, controversial one. I think as, as mentioned earlier that, you know, we, uh, the general public, do not have a uh, very access to some of the real, you know, what is really happening and uh, some of the, the, the information, okay. In uh, terms of the threat, in terms th that's of. That's right. The, the gap between the, the general public awareness and also our LOI's, okay, involvement, the, you know, supervision, okay, and also the, uh, some of the, uh, the, the MODs, uh, the, the claim. MOD is always conservative, very careful not to say anything, immature. Okay, so, however, some of the, uh, the military-related uh, uh, you know, company, like uh, Hanxiang or some, okay, uh, Zhongye, Zhongye Yuan, okay, those institutions do not have the power, I'm sorry, to, to, uh, to claim, the, to, uh, to, to release that some of the, the, the development in news about our indigenous military defense capability. So that, 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 that is giving a, you know, a, a huge gap between the public awareness and what's the real you know, uh, progress. So had that then that would be vulnerable to some of the, some doubt, suspicion, and also from the uh, some of the, uh, the opposition parties, you know, suspect. So I think this uh, has a large room for for improvement. So at this point, back to your question, I hope we are making some progress, but I don't know how much. And this kind of progress will really can really be translated into some real help to our not only the national pride. Okay, we can build up something on our own. We don't, we don't rely on the U.S. support as we used to do in the last century. However, so I think it is a reality. Also, given our military economic constraint, we have to be careful in spending this lot of money in some of the Im immature, okay, uh, the uh, investment in the military okay, spending. So I think that's uh, a long way to go. Progress and uh, management indeed. Stephen, what do you feel Taiwan exactly needs to make Xi Jinping think twice? Well, we have to, um, well, first of all, I think we have to uh, come up with a consensus among the 23 million people that we have to defend our own country. We have to have a st very strong sense of community. Uh, we have to narrow the, 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 the gap and divide, you know, within ourselves. And number two, we have to strengthen and continue to strengthen uh, the defense capability and this is important in a way that um, um, assure, assurance and reassurance, of course, is a good way uh, to deter. But the military capabilities, along with the willingness to fight and defend our own dear country, uh, putting together are also ways to deter. So if we can do this, um, and fortify and, and fostering the deterrence by denial, and it is something working alongside with like-minded countries such as the United States and Japan, th those put it together will really make China to think hard and think twice, which I think at this point in time, because the whole world is ever changing all the time. We really cannot, you know, read through the crystal ball as to what comes up, you know, next year or the year after, or who's gonna you know, uh, run the administrations in other countries such as the United States. So all we can do is do what, do what we can to put things together, and then I think this is the ultimate defense strategy in terms of the, the deterrence by denial. And what we really want uh, to do and to succeed is to make a Xi or any leader in China to wake up in the morning and say, no, not today, and uh, we'll see how it goes. 
and, and it will give us some time and it will continue to do this day building as we talked about. So it's a continuous combination of all those things. Exactly. Jason, um, you've done extensive research on underwater cable lines, a core national interest to many countries. Can you talk about what that means in terms of the Taiwan context? Yeah, obviously Taiwan is situated in a geostrategically important uh, location in terms of Indo-Pacific and First Island chain. And not only that, Taiwan is a global powerhouse of uh, technology and semiconductors. And in addition to that, Taiwan also is the hotspot for all the uh, fiber, optic, upper fiber optic cable um, connections uh, from all major US tech companies that is used in Google, Amazon, uh, Meta, and even like uh, military use uh, cable uh, data transmitting uh, through Taiwan. Which uh, is directly impacting national security. It, it is, it is. And a, a recent uh, outbreak of uh, cable damage near the island of Mazu uh, has caught attention globally, uh, especially not only for our ally countries, uh, Japan and US obviously is paying a lot of attention to the damaged area, but China obviously sees this as a vulnerability, especially when they are engaging in some sort of a gray zone warfare or operations that could compromise the infrastructures over there, and as well as the other activities, economic activities in the neighboring water. So my, my research is that because Taiwan is, is failing to address this issue, now Philippines emerging as the replacement for, uh, uh, in a case that Taiwan's critical infrastructure is broken. And you're seeing US companies and exactly. the military actually flocking there. Exactly, and, and this is what I worry that now because of Taiwan's lack of um, ability to address this issue that more and more companies are shifting the resources or re redeploying their resources in terms of their cable infrastructure and also building more uh, stronger uh, resilience over there. But that is not to say Taiwan is uh, losing its uh, significance in this regard. Uh, it is a signal to Taiwan that we need to double down our critical infrastructure, number one. And secondly, we need to be working with our um, allied and neighbors even more closely. And in a, in a case of Philippines, we need to be reaching out to them and say, hey, look, how can we share our experiences? And how can we you know, uh, build up some sort of uh, um, replacement mechanism that if something is broken in Taiwan and some sort of communication can be quickly patched up uh, through Philippines' support. And I think this type of uh, um, uh, development and uh, alliance can be built by both public and private partnership. And it is very important that I think not only in our government pays attention to this, but our ICT sector uh, can also work on this issue uh, with the uh, Philippines as well. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.